Forensics at Chico State. Uh, if you're in here, then we're going to be talking about counter plans. Happy to see you. Hope you're having a great day. We don't have a ton of time. we got some stuff to get through. I'm assuming y'all already kind of know each other because you're talking a lot. Yes? No? Yeah? Cool. So, let's move on then. What is a counter plan? A counter plan is a plan that is put forth by the negative to demonstrate an opportunity cost of the affirmative plan. By opportunity cost, I mean that it demonstrates if we do that plan, then we cannot do this other plan. If we can't do this other plan, then we're going to be missing out on something that could be great. An alternative means, it is an alternative means of solving the problem that have, has been put forth by the affirmative case. So if it is solving some other problem, then it's probably not going to be a good counterpart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For example, if we're trying to deal with food shortages in Puerto Rico, and a counter plan says we should deal with food sh shortages in Sudan, then there's a big issue there in terms of the problems that are being talked about. They don't actually clash. They don't intend with one, with one another, right? So it's not going to work. Out. Questions? Some requirements for a counter plan. We're going to dig into each of these a little more. All counter plans should be exclusive, meaning it can't happen at the same time as the plan. It should solve the affirmative case, and it should have a net benefit. What do I mean by net benefit? Increase the status quo. Yes. More than. More than the affirmative. So by exclusive, I mean the counter plan should not be possible in a world where the affirmative plan happens. Remember, I said that you want it to be an opportunity cost. So if I say, for example, we have 45 minutes to get food in our vicinity, there is a McDonald's, Carl's Jr., something else, and something else. And I'm like, yo, we should go to McDonald's. And someone's like, all right, we shouldn't go to McDonald's. We should go to Carl's Jr. instead. Well, if we have 45 minutes, we could go to both McDonald's and Carl's Jr., correct? So it doesn't matter. Like, OK, cool, we can do that too. It's relevant. That's different from saying, actually, we should go sit down and eat somewhere. Instead, because the food will be better, we'll be happier with whatever it is for you. Right? At that point, it's an opportunity cost. Because you can't do both. If the affirmative plan and the counter plan can coexist, then the counter plan does not represent an opportunity cost. There's no reason to prefer it. There's no reason to vote down the affirmative. Depending on your theory, the coach, the theory that you think on your own, how you think things through. Uh, counter plans do not create a battle of advocacies. So by saying, by putting forth the counter plan, you are not then saying, this is the advocacy that I'm defending and standing by. It's not something that you have to stick to for the entire piece of paper. Yes. So the counter plan can't be topical and shouldn't be topical in any way, like to the resolution? Uh, it depends on who you ask. The theory that I used initially, that I first learned when I was competing, was that it should not be topical, right? And there's a lot of ways that you can do that while still saying, solving the same affirmative. For example, a lot of our resolutions for Farley will say the United States federal government should, right? So if you're using an agency that is not the United States federal government, then you can fix the same problem while still not being topical. Does that make sense? Unless both the US government and some other government can do it at the same time. Right, and then it could be that, or it could be an organization that's not the U.S. federal government. Right. right. Yeah. Um, it could be the United Nations. It could be the World Food Bank. Right. So would a counter plan essentially mean improving the set improvement that the app gives out, or would it be like, like here's a better alternative? Don't go for the app. Don't go for what we're proposing. 
Kind of. That's why I'm saying it's not just a battle of advocacy. So, for example, if you have two plans that are good, and there's no other reasoning there, there's no other arguments against the case, you are not going to win that round. Unless you have a judge that doesn't really know what's happening. Right? So, typically, there needs to be a net benefit. There needs to be a reason to prefer, and a deficit that you're putting on to the affirmative. Otherwise, what ends up, basically, you just have two affirmatives. Right? And it's not a battle of persuasive speeches and speech and debate. It's about the particular topic in the case that they're moving forward. Yes? Okay. Other questions? Yes? So basically, if you were um, going to introduce a counter plan, would you do that? And then after that, you should still like give a disadvantage to their plan so that it's clear like like yours is still like um, mutually exclusive from theirs? Like your net benefit um, is only for yours? Not in that order. Okay. The counter plan is usually your last or second to last position. What should go first? Decide. Before that. If you have it. Procedurals. Yeah. Top calibre would be a procedural. Why? It's number one voter. Okay, but well, why is it a number one voter? It's the rules of the game. Yeah, it's the rules of the game, which makes it an all or nothing. It's a meta argument, right? It's an argument about the way the debate is happening, as opposed to being about the debate itself. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Uh, it needs to solve the affirmative case. So, usually we agree on harms, right? If there is a case that is talking about gun violence, for example. It's probably not a smart strategy to argue that gun violence isn't a problem in the United States. You're probably going to agree with that. So if your counter plan then doesn't fix or address those harms, uh, that means it's probably not exclusive. Or it's not fixing the issue that's being put forth. So why do it? Right? Maybe it's a great idea and it's fantastic, but it has nothing to do with the topic of the problem that we're addressing today. So great conversation for another time. But right now I think we should fix gun violence. Make sense? Uh, the AF has parametricized, meaning however it is that you may have interpreted the topic, right? When they come into the room, the policy that they are giving you and the way that they are framing the topic within their realm, within their round, Right, in their case, should be the way that you're engaging the topic. So, for example, if they're saying, um, what's the LD? LD is environment this year, right? So if it is, their plan text says, the United States federal government will increase solar panels or something like that. And your counter plan is, well, no, we should increase wind turbines, because that's better, more efficient, so on and so forth, right? You're still inside of the topic area, but at that point, you're not dealing, engaging with the topic in the way that they have framed it. So you're just going to sail past each other argumentatively. Does that make sense? So you got to engage with what they're giving you. Otherwise, it's not going to stick. Um, and that's necessary for their to if you don't have clash, then you're not engaged in their arguments. If you're not engaged in their arguments, then you can't beat them. <coughs> you have to have a net benefit. Remember, a counter plan does not necessarily create a battle of advocacies. I say necessarily, again, depends on your debate theory and who judges. Uh, so just having a better plan is not typically enough to win the round. You need other offense in the round. Something else has to be happening. You must create a deficit to the plan, either with the full fleshed out disadvantage or with the case turn. Are we good on what case turns are? No? Somewhat? So a case turn is where you're taking their argument and saying that that line of reasoning or line of actions actually ends up going the other direction and causing their problem that they are highlighting to get worse instead of better. 
So a way that you could do that, say for example, somebody has a plan that is trying to address gun violence by increasing police patrolling and better arming police officers. You could argue, turn, actually, evidence indicates when you increase police officers and you arm them more, then the individ other individuals arm themselves more. So this would only lead to an increase in gun violence, not a decrease. Make sense? You're just flipping the causality, flipping the direction. The counter plan should solve the case and the disadvantage. That's where you get your net benefit from. Right? You have to say, yes, in the world of the counter plan, the problem still goes away. We're still fixing it. And this problem that you're creating via your plan, we don't create via the counter plan. Uh, you should also have an advantage for the counter plan and arguments for exclusivity, which is why I said it's usually the second to last position. Yes? What does an argument for exclusivity look like? In, just like on a general example level. Just yeah, like so say for example, uh, the plan is to increase border control. And the counter plan is to establish a policy of open borders. The counter plan and the plan are exclusive because you can't e you can't increase patrol for something that no longer exists. Gotcha. Right. So you and make that. Yeah. You make that plan. Yeah. Right. And that's what you're pointing at. That there is something either in terms of policy, in terms of logic, in terms of like rationale, that makes the two ideas incompatible. It can't happen at the same time. Other questions? Okay. Uh, the reason exclusivity is really important is because if you do not have it, then the government, or the affirmative, gets access to an argument called permutation. Permutation is an argument that the affirmative makes stating that the plan and the counter plan can coexist happen simultaneously. Simultaneously is a key word there. Uh, therefore, it's not a reason to vote down the affirmative. Why would simultaneously be a key word there? Because the ideas of the negative are also agreeing with the order of the application. Okay. Like they can work together instead of the right. happening. Right. What, what about in a world where simultaneous isn't there? What then would the affirmative be able to do? You could uh, delay the counter plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then they get to say, look, we'll do the plan, and who knows, maybe the counter plan will happen later. Right? And in reality, that's how that would work. Right? We can do a plan, we could leave the United Nations, and then maybe come back to the United Nations at a later time. But that's not what we're talking about in a debate round, right? We're talking about like a world change at that point in time. So if they can't coexist at the same time, right? And you could argue you also that even the delay would still send us in a particular direction. Okay. Um, successful permutations will typically nullify the offense of the counter plan, which is why it's so important that your counter plan is exclusive. Basically, if the counter plan gets permed, all of the arguments on the counter plan itself will just go away. <coughs> right? And when you're on the affirmative, permutation should be coming out of your mouth every time that you're in a counter plan. Week. Every time. And then you have to think of a perm text, right? Which can be different things, but it doesn't matter. You put them there to make sure that you have them in the fallback box. Why use a counter plan? There's a few reasons I think counter plans can be strategic. One is the time skew. 
usually allows you to agree with the majority of the affirmative case. Right? If you're fixing the same problems, you're not going to say those problems aren't there. Uh, and time that you're not spending arguing the case itself allows you to spend more time fleshing out procedurals, disadvantages, counterplan kind of arguments, basically anything else that you're drawing for. The second reason is that counterplans are flashy. Right? It's an entirely different kind of argumentation that you're putting into the round where you're not just arguing against them but instead making advocacy sounding arguments. So they become distracting. Uh, you can put a counterplan text out there fairly quickly, and you can piece together an advantage for it fairly quickly. It doesn't take a ton of time. It changes the dynamic of the debate round. It forces the affirmative to think like a negative, at least for a second, or at least about that one position. Uh, and it pulls away from a peppering of case arguments. So the counterplan should never be the only thing you have in the round, but you can lose your counterplan and be like, okay, now let's go to the case argument that I made on the first advantage. Here's where we're going to win. Does that make sense? Another reason that I'm just calling hip toss, because that makes sense to me, it allows you to find a pivot point for the affirmative's argumentative momentum and flip them on it. So the counterplan is basically saying, right, yes, I agree with you. All of that is true, however, and the however is the pivot point, right? That's the impulse. And then you make the arguments about the however. But agreeing with most of the case, by agreeing with most of the case, you allow them to do a lot of the justification for your counterplan. So they're not going to get to say these harms don't exist, right? It's in their case. And you force them to think about, okay, what exactly is the difference between these two things here? What is the logic behind those differences? And how do I, how do I then engage them? And it really puts you in control of ground. Forces them to argue what you, what you want them to. Because you're the one that's picking the disadvantage that becomes the difference maker between the counterplan and the problem. Right? You get to control them. And because you're the one that is making the exclusivity arguments, which is saying, I want you to argue this in order to prove that we're not exclusive. And because you can use it to force them to defend something that is seemingly undefendable. And we'll talk about that in a second. So on the last point, consider an affirmative that is built around the policy of banning the death penalty. What might some of the support for that plan be? So as the affirmative, how would you build up why we should ban, ban the death penalty? What would your harms be? Okay. Wrongful convictions. Okay, wrongful convictions. Immoral. Immoral? It keeps people uh, in the prison system like for way too long. Okay. Slightly more critical for a second. Who gets the death penalty the most often? People of color. Right, and that's the strongest argument for the death penalty, right? Wrongful convictions, and although we like to think of the justice system as fair and balanced, typically there are harsher sentences for people of color, right? So, meaning, even with the same crime, you're still going to be killing more people of color than anybody else. Sense. So it's something that's pretty difficult to defend, right? Um, but how can you use that momentum to build a counterplan? Where's the momentum going, right? Violations of human rights, prejudice, people that need to be protected because the law is biased. How can you flip that? You can increase rehabilitative efforts. 
or like something along the lines of like rehabilitative policy or something like that. Okay. What's wrong with that idea though? It could be permed. Yes. It could be permed. Yeah, it doesn't contain. Does this make any exception? No, right? There's no, it's just a ban. So then what do you get to pull out? You can like create a policy that only um, bans certain types of death penalty. You could, or you, I mean, the answer is you can pull out whatever you want, you can right? Exactly. So the death penalty be, should be banned. Sure, I agree, 100%. Except for, what's the worst kind of crime you could think of? Mass murder, let's go with that. Sure, mass murder. Serial pedophilia. Okay. Right, raping kids. Think about it. Now they have to be like, wait a minute, hold on. It's like, well, no, look, we're down. Everybody except those people. And now they're in the corner where that's what they have to try to defend. Right? And I guarantee you, they're not going to. Because you can't. How do you defend them? <laughs> right? There's arguments, certainly, that they can make. But, like, would it, like, a life sentence prevent um, a pedophile from being able to serially commit crimes? Sure. But it doesn't prevent a rapist from being a rapist. But if they're, like, in jail, then they can't. More access children and therefore you know they could get out yeah. you never know there's, there's, they could escape that's also a possibility hold on hold on though because think about what i said it doesn't prevent a rapist from being a rapist yeah. mm -hmm. like so what is the jail? are we specifically mm -hmm. saying like serial pedophilia yeah, yeah. pedophilia yes. but like they can but like pedophilia is raping or like children. involves children so yes. if they're in jail then, like, it's not the rape, it's the fact that they won't have access to children. Right. But right. I mean, but what I'm saying is, like, them. that doesn't mean that they won't then start raping other people. You're just, you know, right. but then you're just changing. Yeah, yeah instead of raping children, they rape, children, they rape other adults. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. still yeah. bad. You're just changing like, the demographic of who they rape. They're still yeah. raping. Yeah. But certainly, like, that could be an argument. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. that, well, they'll be in jail. So it doesn't happen. Let's try to keep the discussions focused so that we're all discussing it together. Go ahead. What are the ways to kind of defend that and avoid being like shamed or something like you truly defend something like that? Yeah, well, I think. I think that there are theoretical arguments which would argue that that's an illegitimate type of counter. Right? Um, there are arguments against blind inclusive counterparts, <coughs> which is what that would be uh, called the picks, because you're taking something out of it and then using the rest of the plan with that exception. Um, there's other arguments that you can make, like that would be a solid argument, it's intuitive, it makes sense, right? In terms of the fact that they're going to be in prison for life anyways, so that we wouldn't have that problem. Um, you could also make ethical arguments about the fact that it doesn't, that's them too, right? Like, and I don't think that would make you a shit person. That's an argument that a lot of people aren't willing to hear. But yeah, there's still people, right? So other questions? Okay. I think the best argument against that is probably the idea of like, look, if rehabilitation doesn't work at all, right? If we're just gonna argue that there's no possibility of rehabilitation, then we've been lying to ourselves about the justice system this entire time. Right, like, why have any sentence? Why not every crime would be a life, be a life sentence? Then, if there's no chance for people to change, that makes sense. Okay. Other questions? All right. So, what kind of evidence would you need in order to set the case up in a way that gets you? Not for the affirmative, though, for the kind. How would you have to frame your arguments to get there? Do we need to fix 
statistics for that certain exception that is on that is going to receive the death penalty, mm -hmm. or like and versus those who are not, or just yeah, just the ones with the death penalty. You could also get some of the statistics on how long those types of like uh, cases go and how many occur, right? Because like if you're an AF, you probably make some sort of argument about the economics of how like the prison system works and okay. like the death penalty. So you could be like, well, if we ban all death penalties except for these very few, like we're still cutting down that cost. Yeah, yeah, that would be a defense in terms of them trying to say that you link into a disadvantage. But then also recidivism rates, right? For whatever populace it is that you're pulling out. So, for example, go. I was going to say something else, but if you want to finish that first, like an alternate, another okay. one. I would say like doing anything all or nothing is never like the best idea. As like if like how to set yourself up for that place is like saying that all or nothing is like the only option here with the death penalty or not the death penalty. It's just like a bad scenario to be in, and it's always good to like find that middle ground. And compromise in between, and that's where your net ground really is. Okay. Yeah, that wouldn't really help you for the counter plan in this instance, though. Right? Because then the compromise in this instance, you would, it still would be an all or nothing for a particular group of people. Right? Yeah. And then the other argument would be that the death penalty is never all or nothing, that there's always a common ground or a middle ground built into the system, and that not everybody gets that sentence. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not sure if this was exactly what you were asking, but when you're making that counterpoint argument, one could say that if the app is arguing that we want to ban the death penalty so that we can focus on re rehabilitation of these people, you could say, okay, well, these exceptions are hindering rehabilitation because we were talking about like serial pedophiles and mm -hmm. how they can still rape, right? And if they are going around doing this behavior, um, that would definitely hinder rehabilitation for people who are actually going through that profit that process, excuse me, that have lower crimes, so to say. So that might be an argument you could make in your counter plan. Yeah, and that would be the statistics that you would need, right? Yeah. Is these individuals, when they leave the system, end up back in the system for the same crime at X percentage. It's a just don't count. Oh, just count. Oh, okay. Um, end up back in the system at this percentage, right? After they leave a second time, they end up back in the system at this percentage. Meaning, no matter how much time they spend in prison, this problem is never being fixed, right? Therefore, capital punishment. Obviously, the other answer to that, which doesn't help us in the counter plan, but I think it's just important to understand, is that there's probably something wrong in the prison system. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So consider a plan that uses ice to combat human trafficking. How many you attack this point? You could probably make the argument that ICE is racist. Okay. Yeah. How many people have been lost in ICE after like that was in ICE um, yeah, captivity? Okay. Containment, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that's what, no, I was thinking contentity too, but I was like, that's not the word. Mm -hmm. I mean it's a strategic word for us. Yeah. Could you say that ICE could be like a mask and, and instead of combating human trafficking they could have some other motives but they covered up with the term to combat human trafficking? Like they're really you could, but that gets into a weird theoretical place yeah. about affirmative intention and then like I guess like hiding malicious intent, right? So like yeah. if the app is saying this is what they're doing. And then your argument is like, well, ICE is just using that as a cover to do this. You're really saying the affirmative is using that as a cover to do this. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Could you say there's a better agent instead of ICE? Yeah. Exactly. Right? And you think about the harms for human trafficking. What is the affirmative probably going to be saying? Uh, human dignity, stuff like that. Right. Modern slavery. Human dignity, it's usually the most vulnerable people that end up being human trafficked. They're usually <coughs> forced by drugs, right? Kept in a like, limited state of consciousness, abused, so on and so forth, right? There's definitely going to be a pathos heavy, like, this is absolutely horrible and we have to fix it. 
So that's the momentum, right? That's the direction they're going. So then how do you pivot and flip that? I definitely think the other agent uh, idea is like a good one. Mm -hmm. And then kind of building off of the fact that like, how can you trust ICE if they're constantly committing human rights violations anyways? Right. So how do you articulate that in a way that turns the direction of the argument? Yes. There's been organizations doing this for longer periods of time than ICE. ICE is like new to the table. Um, and okay. Like sort of like that flow of argument in a way, or okay. like so that gets that gets to like the justification for an agency switch, but we're still a step before that. I'm sorry, I'm kind of just in like kind of different place. I was like like this idea of like you know another agent doing the action, but how would you be able to do that kind of counter plan and gain a sense of exclusivity? Like why can't it be that agent and I like another agent and I? That's where the disadvantage. Okay. Yeah. So that's why that's why I'm trying to get at right now, right? Like, how do we take this story, and then use the agent specifically to flip that? So certainly that they have problems, right? But then the way to articulate that term in a way that makes sense and that also taps into the same pathos is like, look. Go ahead. It can't be ICE because people who are being humanly trafficked don't trust ICE and they won't like get out or something like that. So that would be a solvency here. Oh, right, absolutely. Wouldn't that's the, all this argument makes sense. Here and then. Okay. I don't know if it'll be a disad, but there could be evidence from the NIG saying that ICE, instead of combating human trafficking, they've actually not enabled human trafficking, but there has still been kind of human trafficking going under the rug through ICE, like via ICE. Not saying that they're supporting it and they're um, like enabling human trafficking to happen, but it's just, it still happens and it's not combating it. It's, okay. it's not completely helping the situation. Okay. Yeah. So solvency. Yeah. Yes. Would the detention centers not be the pathos argument? Right? Yeah. Is the like constant horrendous abuse of people in these detention centers facilitated through ICE as an organization, but also ICE agents as people? Like they have, they know that ICE agents are beating people in these detention centers. Yes. So they're committing horrible like human rights violation, and then they're going to come in and say, we've come to stop you from committing human rights violations. Right. Like, nobody's going to buy that for a second. Exactly. Yes. Um, I think I'm still confused on how this would be exclusive with, if we were doing a counter plan of using another agency to combat human trafficking, like going back to the like Burger King or McDonald's thing, like, mm -hmm. like why can't Burger King or McDonald's both do this? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, why can't ICE and another agent both do this, even if we have disadvantages? Like, what? How is it exclusive? Right. So that's where you're building off of. Like, well, first you can you would have to differentiate it in terms of the agency, because ICE is the only like arm that the U.S. federal government would have to actually go out and enforce this. Right. Like it's built into the name. So what you would have to do once you get to the agency section of it is actually change that to state and local authorities that are more familiar with like the community and so on and so forth that would be able to go out and. Right, and those authorities don't actually have detention centers, so that's where the exclusivity would come from. And the net benefit is going to be built into what he was just talking about in the back, right? Right. But then you need to double down on that. Okay. So the double down goes: Look, you have this whole story about everything that is happening in terms of human trafficking and all the atrocities. Then you want to step in, remove people from that situation, and throw them into an equally bad situation or almost as bad, right? Like sure, you're not forced to give them drugs at this point, but there's been like high reporting of sexual assault, the living conditions are horrendous, there are abuses that are happening, right? Like all these things are still happening. And then given the current administration, probably deportation. And then they end up back into the human trafficking system properly. Right. So first you double what's happening in terms of trauma, right, and negative experience. Then you push them away as if they're not your problem, right? And then, absolutely, you leave them open to end up back in the same situation. So, turn, you're, you're not, or at least no solvency, right? At least you're not fixing the problem. Second, for the individuals that you're trying to help, you're making the situation equally as bad, 
possibly worse because you show them a light and then immediately snuff it out. And then you leave them equally vulnerable to the same issue. Right? Therefore, counter your Rather than the United States federal government help, like combating human trafficking, we should use state and local agencies, and there's a specific name that I looked up that I can't remember now, in order to combat human trafficking. Right? The advantage to that would be there's no detention centers. They're not required, excuse me, they're not required to deport people. Right? Nor are they directly underneath the arm of the administration that's telling people to deport people. Right? So you get them out without re-entrenching them into the same system. Make sense? And they're exclusive because, well, I mean, I guess the exclusivity argument is still like sort of a kicker there because you could still argue both agencies can just do the same thing because redundancy happens in the government. So you would just buckle down on the disadvantage, right? on the solvency arguments and the disadvantage. And then, even if you lose the exclusivity argument, you still have the case turning the disadvantage. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's all I am. Okay. So, questions? Uh, it yeah. can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about uh, Could we get access to the slide? Um, I could.